Good morning, dear friends. I'm joining you once again for our unity service on the 25th of June, 2023. And in choosing a title for my presentation today, I always come back uh, for other sessions as well. I always come back to the idea of bringing it together, bringing it together. What it could be would be the five unity principles. God is, I am, I think, I pray, I live the principles. And so as we look over the past week, the events of the week, maybe you have some dominant thoughts about what has been important to you. I'm a person of faith, but I'm also a person of science because I believe that the God of omnipotence and of omnipresence and of omniscience, omnis that's easy for me to say, omniscience created science, created everything. So it's a tool. The scientific ideas lately have to do with exploration. Maybe the, the submersible craft, the uh, Titan, maybe that comes to mind for you. And it has for me many times because I have liked exploration in some chapters of my life. And so I wonder, you know, God made science, yes. So the moment comes to mind, that moment of uncertainty. Maybe there were certain cues aboard the craft that not everything was working the way they had expected. And what were the thoughts that come to a crew in those circumstances? And what are the cues or the thoughts that come to each of us when we are in the dark moment of the soul or when we are experiencing that dark night? What are the uncertainties and how do we come through to the other side? And those are key questions that everyone asks, whether or not they are people of faith, I believe. We all have some issues to contemplate. And so it's a big question. You know, and I have a, an old uh, parable that comes from the Sufi tradition. As you know, the Sufi people are an inner organ of Islam. And this is uh, practically verbatim. I may edit a little bit as I go along. There's a well-known Eastern legend, legend giving the idea of a soul who had found truth. There was a wall of laughters and of smiles surrounding their, their environment. And this wall had existed for ages and uh, nobody knew what was beyond the wall. And uh, many tried to climb the wall, but they were not successful. And those who had climbed upon the wall saw something beyond and it was so fascinating to each of those explorers so fascinating and yet so indescribable that they couldn't describe when they'd come back down off the wall they could not describe what they saw and so the people of the town began to wonder what magic could there be beyond the wall and what attraction and whoever climbed the wall never returned why was that why did no one have the ability to describe what they had seen. So they also called the wall, the wall of mystery. And then they said, we must take someone and uh, send someone to the wall. And when they reach the top, they'll look over the wall, but we will tie a rope, tie a rope. When this person climbs with the rope, we will let that person see what was beyond. And then we'll pull that person back so that we can interview and find out what the heck is beyond this wall. So when the man they had sent, in this case, it happened to be a man, although we know women are equally capable. The man they had sent reached the top of the wall and he smiled. He looked back and smiled. And then he looked back over the wall and lifted his leg to climb over the wall, but they pulled him back. They jerked on his chain. Maybe you've experienced this lately, somebody jerking on your chain. They pulled him back and still he smiled. And when the people eagerly asked, what did you see? What was it? What was it? Why is everybody so fascinated? 
he had no answer. He just smiled. This is the condition of the seer, the man or the woman who in the shrine of his or her heart has seen the vision of God. The one who has the realization of truth can only smile for words can never really explain what that truth is. So there you have it. That's a Sufi legend. So that's the way it is with uh, some of us and some of you present today and beyond present, the presence of today, that we have had visions. We've had things that we just cannot describe because they were meant for us personally. They were meant for us as recipients, able to interpret for ourselves. But these visions are designed for us at the level of our understanding. That's an important idea to remember. So in coming up with this idea, that moment of truth, maybe in the submersible uh, craft, maybe they were looking for their truths. Maybe there was a time when maybe the most fearful person among them, the most hesitant, said, what am I doing here? What is this? You know, I'm inside this minivan-sized craft. Something is going to happen. I don't know what it is. And there was wonderment in there. There was wonderment. So that's a big question. You know, what are our tools now? These tools we have for discovery are tools that every person has. Every mind is capable of using our concentration, our contemplation, and our meditation. And those three ideas, I believe, span across all of the faith traditions that are unified each time we get together. Some of us have different roots. Some of us are having a coming from a foundation of Christianity or Islam or Judaism. Now, those three, those are the descendants of Abraham, are they not? Abraham. Let's stop fighting, you know. We're under one umbrella. And then the Eastern traditions also. So these contemplative, contemplative moods we can bring about among ourselves and among each other, these are powerful tools. So in the, within the contemplation, we have a very powerful tradition of Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina is living in the scriptures. It could be the Judeo-Christian Bible. It could be the Bhagavad Gita, the, um, the holy books of all the religions, the Guru Granth Sahib of, uh, of the Sikh faith. All of the holy books are important. We can find truths that correspond across the lines of these faith traditions. So in contemplation, maybe you'll pick a scripture to live in for a while. Maybe you'll put yourself back into the time of John and the other disciples. Maybe you'll contemplate John writing where he was. Or followers of John, admirers of John who wrote in his tradition. That's an important idea too. That in those times, writing under the name of someone you greatly admired, that was a legitimate thing to do to use that person's name for your writing. So whoever wrote that verse from John that we quoted earlier in Daily Word, maybe that has something to do with how you will connect with the scriptures to find your wisdom. And so a greater umbrella is the idea that we get wisdom from each other. I don't know how much wisdom I have. I'm getting it from others. And I sort of piece it all together. And uh, that's the way I think I have a little cre credibility as with with all of you maybe you're doing something similar but we have two ideas under this contemplative mood we have monism and we have dualism monism is a tradition or a group of traditions that say God is one we are all part of God we are all part of the big soul the Mahat Mahatma great soul we're all pieces, pieces of that. That is monism. Dualism says there is God and there is the human mind. And I want to get back to connect with God. 
So the dualism has two parts. We are one part. The divine is another part. And maybe you vacillate between the two. I do. Sometimes I don't feel as close to the creator as I want to. So I use my tools. I use my tools and I come back to the center. And one of the ways I enjoy my own faith, my composite of many faiths, is to look at the teachings of theosophy. Maybe you've heard this word, which is a scientific application of philosophy and of uh, theism to bring things together. And there's the contemplative subject of the fourth dimension. So thinking beyond the length, width, and thickness of this tangible world we have around us, thinking beyond that, maybe contemplation can give us that. Now, a little digression. I made this pair of psychic binoculars. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. And at the top of each of the tubes, left and right, we have an inert gas valve. This means you can open the valve and the inert gases will be ventilated. What do you think of that? Psychic binoculars. So I'm going to take a look now and see what's going on. Uh-oh. Oh, I can only smile. By the way, these are on sale to you for $49.95. Just call the number at the bottom of your screen. Okay, back to Sirius now. So we have this deep ocean. Isn't it ironic, by the way, that the life we know, all of this life, came first from the oceans. Where did the oceans come from? comets for millennia millions of years comets hitting the earth melting down putting their stuff onto the earth and those original proteins were the seeds of life so we came originally from the ocean and now the ocean is calling some people back to the ocean that irony doesn't escape me pal i'm in it with you i have enormous questions about this so it's a little bit scary is it not you think of the next life what is beyond this apparent death i accept the doctrine of reincarnation that's the way we can explain talent and uh, proclivities of different kinds and the strengths and weaknesses that we appear to have i believe in the reincarnation doctrine you may not and that's fine so the uncertainty you know i like the idea that going to the next existence is like entering a different room i don't know what's in the room when i go to a new gathering i don't know what's there and that's fine for that moment i just don't know positive negative i don't know so what am i afraid of am i afraid of fear itself yes thank you mr president roosevelt do we have tools to deal with this of course we do we can turn fear into respect. Now there's a different idea where we can rise a little bit to look at the fear we have with some respect, with some awe and appreciation for the opportunities. And here the opportunity to deal with the fear, that's a, a very important idea. We always have the tools. We may always have fear, we may conquer it or not, but we always have tools for dealing with it. And uh, another little thing I want to share is the idea of contemplative drawing or writing, going into a deeper level of yourself and then drawing something, letting your pen or your pencil move. I'm going to share something intimate with you. And uh, my ideas about motherhood are very sacred. I lost my own mother um, and with my sister and brother younger than me. My mom was 24, excuse me, she was 48. I was 24. She was 48. And when that happened, it was the worst thing in the world. And that's why I'm a crazy man today, because I don't have anything 
that's going to be a greater loss than that. You know, at that age, with that event, it colored everything. So I was contemplating the life of Jesus and the life of Mary. And Mary, a supreme figure of motherhood, and uh, along with Kuan Yin and some other figures, of course. But to me, Mary is the dearest mother. And I was thinking, what was it like for her? So I closed my eyes and I started to scribble a little bit. And then I'd open my eyes and peek to where the point of my pen was. And I'd draw a little more and I'd peek again. And I'd draw a little more. And I came up with a drawing, which I call Mary after the crucifixion, which I'll, I'll show you now. So it's a pen and ink drawing. And that's what came to me. If you were to contemplate the same idea, your ideas would be a little different because they'd be covered and colored by your understanding. And everyone's understanding, everyone's insights are equal in my eyes. Everyone has the ability to use our unity tools. So when we're looking at our meditation, I'm gonna guide you a little bit with a meditation. And I have some music to play. I have a couple of flutes behind me, a couple of guitars. So this meditation idea is going to take us from fear into respect. Because we're able to transmute, transmute, changing something into a better form, a more com compatible form with what we believe, a more uh, way, a better way of sharing our thoughts with others. Because in order to have more meaning in life, sharing is a very important idea. And we should become, we should become more comfortable, in my opinion, with having conversations, open-ended conversations to find the common ground among all of the faith traditions and all of the political thoughts. I know political things and religious things. We're told that we shouldn't talk about those things. I have a slightly different opinion. I think it's fine to ask respectful questions so we can come up with common ground. We're all world citizens. The world is now too small to be afraid of things we don't understand with the advent of the internet. Now the internet is old hat. Our children are growing up with the internet. They know more about it than I do, I know. But we look at the rapid changes in the world that are understood and observed instantly by everyone. One thing happens on the other side of the planet and within seconds, everybody has access to that. So that's a tool. We don't have to be afraid of that. That is a tool and an opportunity for our growth. So we're thinking about this moment of truth that some people are exposed to all of a sudden, you know, that, that nightmarish thing about being under 6,000 pounds of pressure on every square inch of the body, what happens in, in, that, in that moment? Well, we go to the other side and we smile because maybe that's the only thing left is a big smile into the light. So I'm going to look at the, the science of all of this. Well, you know that some scientists say, and I, don't, I can't quote on this, but some people have observed when a person makes her or his transition, they have observed that there's a slight, a slight loss of volume and weight, supposedly because the material of the soul has evacuated the physical being. There's plenty to read on that subject. So what is it? What is the leaving the body? I don't know. I can smile about it, though. I can smile about it. So in looking at the next thing, the next thing that happens, you know, that next thing looks more and more familiar to me as I'm aging. It's a natural thing to wonder what is going to happen. And I'm grateful to have reached this level. With a little bit of luck, my two daughters are going to reach this age. You know, I'm certainly hoping they have more wisdom than I do. Well, I'm going to invite us to contemplate and then meditate. So let's see, I'm checking my time. I don't want to overstay my uh, welcome, if in fact I'm welcome.
I don't know. I'll just smile. So um, I want you to think of the instrument that you would like to hear from today. I have an alto flute and a, a C flute, and I have a guitar. So all those who want to hear the guitar today, keep your hands down. Oh, very good, very good. All of those who want to hear a flute this morning, you also keep your hands down. I'm reading you psychically. Very good. The guitar has it. I'm going to reach back over me. This is a guitar I've just acquired. It was made in uh, 2012 by Herman Vasquez Rubio. And he immigrated from Michoacan, Mexico, where my mother's family uh, came from, Mexico generally, not that area. And he settled in, um, in 1970, he settled in California. And this is one of his guitars. Yeah. And it was patterned after the guitars made by Hermann Hauser. And he was a favorite luthier of Andres Segovia who was a pioneer of putting the classical guitar on the concert stage. That was his thing to do. That's why he's remembered. He drew huge audiences. So I have a guitar that was patterned by Hermann Hauser and made, brought into this world by Hermann Vasquez Rubio. So I'm gonna play an improvisation on this guitar. <laughs> So I invite you to, to sit tall in a meditative mode. And just feel your breath now. Pick a tempo of breathing that suits you. So you breathe in the peace of this universe. Exhale tension. And breathe in strength. And you exhale uncertainty. You breathe in respect. And you exhale fear. Continue to sit. Your breath takes you to a deeper place. I'm going to come to a place of silence now. And I'll call you back in about three minutes. And all you need to do is continue to let your thoughts flow through you, unencumbered.
stay just the way you are for a moment. And we allow our thoughts to come back to the present moment. And we very gently and respectfully release the meditation technique back to the source. And we release this with love, with deep respect, with appreciation for this time you have spent with your body and with your mind as gateway to the soul. So we're coming back and you always take your time with this process so that we hold on to the peacefulness. We can hold on to the deep rest. You can start to move your hands and feet a little bit, maybe do a few circling movements with your neck. We're bringing body and mind back together. You can slowly open the eyes. If this is too soon, you just keep the eyes closed a little longer. So maybe you have experienced a little bit of the divinity that we all have. Great. And if not, it's coming. It's always there. In my personal practice, when that happens, I start all over again. Posture, breath, rhythmic breathing. And then I allow my mantra to come in. You allow it. You don't say it. You listen for it. Because so many minds on the Akashic record have been meditating for millennia. These traditions I describe go back maybe 3,000 years but uh, that's a matter of faith also. Well, here we are, we're back again. So uh, I want to help us come back. I'm gonna play a little improvisation now on the flute. Uh, this is an alto flute. That's why I look so small, because the flute is big. But I'm not all that big anyway, you know. So here is a little improvisation on an alto flute. Have a good time in your mind, okay? Have a party in your mind. Allow me to thank you for coming across your computer screen this morning, you beautiful people, you wonderful soul personalities. So that's my offering for this morning. And Neil, I'm in your hands now.